can stop by the security lab and we'll have, was it Splash? Yes. 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 Splash Cafe. Yeah. Uh, so we'll have food from them if you want to grab one before they enter. Um, so yes, and then next week we're going to have another general meeting, same time, not to run the place. Same but place. Same place. And then it, that will be on Intro to Unix. So we'll be talking about that, for, especially for the freshmen, and like helping you guys get introduced to how to use Unix. And yes, yeah, so now we'll move it over to, sorry. Also, we will be watching War Games that Friday night. Uh, next Friday night. So, yes. Now, Dr. Peterson will be giving a talk on file system encryption, and he is one of the professors here at Cal Poly, so please give him your full attention. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a second. All right. Okay. All right, thank you, Brent. Uh, evening, everyone. Nice, nice to see you. Thank you for, for coming out. Um, so uh, I was asked by White Hat to come out and give a talk, uh, and they uh, only give me a little bit of guidance. And so what I thought would be fun is, that's, that's fine. Uh, um, what I thought I would talk about is a recent research result that uh, Tim Peters, who is a recently graduated master's student, and I recently got accepted uh, to NDSS, which I'm very uh, proud to say is is maybe uh, one of, if not the top tier uh, computer security conferences. So um, this is relevant work. It's really kind of exciting stuff, I think. Uh, and it has to do uh, largely around the way storage systems have changed over time. And mostly the technologies are changing. And also the way we use them. Okay, so it used to be if you had a long-term data store, it was on rotating media in a big cabinet someplace or a big server and never went any place. Um, so two things are different about what we do now. We carry things in our pocket, right, that store multiple, multiple gigabytes, and we put a lot of sensitive data on this, and the storage device in here is totally different. It's totally different physical characteristics uh, than a rotating media. And so there actually hasn't been a lot of progression in how we did encryption from um, hard disk drives on a server to what encryption should look like or might look like on a mobile device with a solid state drive or, or NAND, uh, NAND flash. Okay? Uh, and what we posited and have not proven yet, and this is still kind of an open problem, uh, but what we hypothesized is that old encryption schemes actually become insecure, they become broken when you move to solid state drives. This is still an open question, and the reason it's still an open question is it's kind of expensive. Um, it would require deconstructing or desoldering a, a NAND drive. It's not as immediate as just kind of like looking in the NAND drive and doing some function and getting data out again. But we think an adversary, a sophisticated adversary, but an, a, a, an, a, an, an existing adversary, let's say a three-letter agency, um, <laughs> has plenty of capability to do the type of break that we think is possible. Anyways, okay, so the um, title of this uh, talk is uh, DEFI. So uh, DEFI stands for Deniable Encrypted File System. Oops. File System from <laughs> uh, YAFs. Uh, so YAFS uh, is uh, yet another acronym for uh, yet another flash file system. Okay, so YAFS uh, once was, and, uh, and is still used a little bit today, the default file system that's used in Android. Okay, and it was designed specifically for some of the special characteristics of flash storage. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but one of the things that we've kind of moved away from is that uh, one of the things that YAFS does is preserve the life of flash storage. Okay? So one of the, and I'll talk in more detail about this later, but so flash storage, you can only write to it so many times. Like NAND memory, you can only write to it so many times before it just stops taking writes. It just dies. Okay? So we call this like the uh, program erase cycle. And for a cheap NAND device, like the type of thing that's in your uh, iPod or in your iPhone or in your Android device, is probably on the order of, let's say, 10,000, maybe 50,000 cycles. Okay? So what we have to be careful of is to distribute our writes evenly across the, the, the storage medium. 
Now, we don't have to do that with, with hard disk drives. As far as we know, hard disk drives last a, a really, really long time, so long as you um, kind of keep them in, under regular conditions, normal conditions. NAND devices uh, are only designed to last a few years, okay? And that works fine for us because we tend to rotate our phones, you know, every, that, that often. Um, but it's this um, built-in, never write in the same place that makes encrypted file systems, which were designed for hard disk drives, where you could write. In fact, the security is predicated on your ability to be able to overwrite in place. You can no longer do that in flash storage, okay? So that's one of the big problems that we, we needed to solve. All right. The other thing that's, that's in here that I haven't really talked about yet is deniable. So this is actually kind of a, um, an, an emerging area. Well, it's, it's been around for a while, but people are starting to be more curious about it now. So beyond just encrypting your data, okay? So let's say um, you've taken, let's say you're an aid worker, okay? You're a human rights aid worker, and you're in some war-torn country uh, with an unfriendly government. Okay? And you're taking pictures of um, human rights abuses on your phone so that you can then get them out of the country and you know, take them back to your NGO and report on them or take them back to the UN, who knows, okay? But you need to cross certain border checkpoints that are um, controlled by the adversary, right? Controlled by the bad guy, controlled by this, this evil government. Uh, and they're gonna take your phone and they're gonna look at it, okay? And they may even image it. Um, and when I say evil, you know, evil country, you know the, 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 the TSA can totally do this too, right? As you cross the border, um, if you are within 100 miles of a border, if you are coming from a foreign country, they can take your devices and image them, um, apparently. Uh, okay, so <laughs> encrypted data. So let's say I'm a, I'm a border guard. I'm a technical savvy border guard. And I see in, encrypted data looks a lot different than regular data. Right? Encrypted data, if you ever kind of open it up and look at it, it looks scrambled, right? And that's good, right? It should be kind of indistinguishable from something that's truly random. But it tells the adversary that that's probably sensitive data, right? That's probably something that I would want decrypted. And so now I point a gun at you and I say, decrypt it. And if you don't compel that key, or that key is not compelled, bad things might happen, right, to you, okay? So deniability is an additional idea built on top of encryption that says not only is the data encrypted, but that I can actually deny that any data exists on there, okay? So maybe the easiest way to think about this is, so imagine if your hard disk all looked random, okay? There wasn't like just zero blocks if there was no data. The whole thing looked random. And so then the, the guy says, well, in, decrypt this thing. And he said, look, it's a, it's a fresh file system. I don't, I don't have the key. Right, that's, and he says, well, you know, you better give me a key. So you give up one key, and maybe there's multiple keys, right? So as far as the data is concerned, maybe there's multiple levels, multiple security levels. So you give up one, and so some data becomes decrypted. And he says, well, give me another key. He's like, I don't have any, right? I, I, I can't, you have some plausible deniability as to, like, he can't prove by pointing at some data and say, you can decrypt this, okay? This is what some of the properties of, of modern cryptographic uh, primitives give us. Okay, so this is the idea that we wanted to build in. Um, so in addition to being encrypted, we wanted to have some deniability. Okay, so uh, this is sometimes also called a steganographic. Okay, a steganographic. Steganographic means to kind of hide in plain sight. Okay, there's all kinds of uh, cute steganography solutions over the years. Uh, apparently, um, uh, World War II POWs used to uh, trade Bibles and then would put pinholes over the letters that they wanted to communicate. And so, you know, if there was a T and somewhere later it was an H and then an E, you would hold up the light and say, ah, the. And they would communicate secretly with one another, maybe plans to escape or uh, this is all, I don't, I don't know how uh, valid these, these rumors are, but so, and uh, JSTAG, have you ever seen JSTAG? So, you know, a, a JPEG image only uses the first seven bits of a byte. So the last bit is, is kind of meaningless, uh, or at least isn't interpreted by the, by the, J, uh, the JPEG um, uh, library, the, the codec. So you can actually put data there, right? So every eighth bit, you can store more information. So um, there's been a long rumor that maybe Al Qaeda is using uh, normal forums and posting, like, you know, like uh, let's say a car forum and posting pictures of their cars and then hiding secret Al Qaeda messages. Um, 
who knows. Uh, it, it, there's been studies where people have gone out and like, grabbed all the images that they could and looked for steganographic information and haven't found anything. Um, so that's, that's just speculation. But this is like hiding data. It's not proper encryption. Um, it, it hasn't been, it has no rigor, right? It's mostly just heuristics. There's been some work, though, trying to make steganographic file systems more rigorous, okay? It's not just hiding it in you know, hidden places. It's trying to figure out how, you how do you actually hide data in plain sight, okay? And there's essentially um, two techniques uh, that we do. And one is to use crypto, okay? So uh, one of the earliest works in this uh, was called STEGFS. And uh, the way this thing worked is you would take your, so this is data, like your file, okay? And it breaks it into blocks. Your file system does this anyway, right? Uh, and takes this and it sticks it into an encryption function, along with some key, and out comes ciphertext blocks. Okay, so uh, typically we call these plain texts, and we'll call these the resulting ciphertexts. Oops, C. Okay, now down here is actually the storage device. And in STEGFS, this was a hard disk drive. And your hard disk drive is, is broken into blocks as well, okay? Your block device driver does this for you, okay? All of the data to start with on STEGFS is encrypted, okay? So we have no idea what this stuff looks like. I mean, I'm sorry, we, it's, it, just, it looks scrambled, right? The last step that STEGFS does is to put the, um, these blocks, or at least, uh, so these are, these are logical addresses, right? Put these logical addresses into a pseudorandom function, okay? Like a hash function, which I'll just call H. Who has some pseudorandom properties, meaning that you're gonna put some input in and the output's gonna be unpredictable. And what I'm gonna use that unpredictability for is placing these blocks on disk. Okay, so maybe that's uh, C0, and maybe C1 goes over here, and maybe C3 goes here, right, and so on, okay? And so without knowing kind of how this function is computed, that an adversary can't look at this disk and say like, you know, decrypt these blocks, okay? So I can kind of hide them in plain sight. Now the problem is, that, and this is actually a problem with all deniable file systems, is that there's a risk for overwriting, okay? There's a risk that if I store C0 here for this file, and I do this again, there's some probability that this hash function is gonna generate this logical address again, and I'll overwrite my data, okay? In fact, most, um, uh, most deniable file systems have this problem to some extent, okay? Because if you're essentially pretending that some of this data is unallocated, there's a chance that it's gonna get overwritten, right? If you know it's not, uh, if you know it's allocated, then so does your adversary, right? So you have to kind of play along. You've got to have some plausible deniability and risk overriding data. So what we try to do is come up with schemes that minimize the chance of overriding, okay? Your hash function, if your domain is big enough, meaning that if you're kind of the size of your disk is, is big enough, the chances of finding a collision, meaning that two of these numbers uh, are the same, two of these logicals are the same, is, is small, smallish, okay? And it's certainly workload dependent, okay? So that, that's an important idea to keep in mind. All right. So I already mentioned, so the, the, the thing that we're, the problem we're trying to motivate here is that we have new technologies, we store sensitive data on them, and that they're available to our adversary in a way that haven't been available to before, right? So if I had a server and it was in my house, and my adversary was, let's say, the U.S. government, they had to get a warrant, right, to come into my house and take my stuff, okay? If I'm traveling with my cell phone, it's, you know, there's, it's a little fuzzy right now about whether they can take your device, certainly when you're crossing a border from a foreign country, they can take your device and image it, right? In fact, they might do this multiple times. So this is a new kind of adversary that previous work hasn't considered before. So uh, previous work considers what we call the, the single view adversary, meaning the, the adversary that gets to look at your hard disk once and go, hmm, you know, can you decrypt some of these blocks for me? And you say, I can't because that block is not allocated. That block is just a random block, okay? 
the more advanced, the more sophisticated, and probably the more realistic adversaries, the one that we modeled, and we call it the snapshot adversary, or the kind of sometimes it's called the peekaboo adversary, uh, which is kind of a stupid name. Uh, <laughs> but so imagine, so at point time zero, right? I see, I get, I get to image your drive, and I may not be able to see. Right, which I can't tell you, or I can't point a gun at you and tell you to describe blocks because you have, you have some plausible deniability. Right? You basically say, this is a fresh file system, or I don't have keys, or whatever. At time t1, though, let's say you've written some data. Okay? And a few of these blocks have changed. What does that tell the adversary? Yeah, that you've, you've written some data. Right? You need to, now I'm going to say, that data's changed you need to come up with an explanation for why that data changed. So there's been a little bit of previous work on trying to come up with plausible explanations for why, why this can happen. It usually is some sort of BS heuristical argument about uh, cover data. So just my file system every now and then just writes random data. Okay? Uh, or for every block that I write, another block gets written somewhere else. This is really problematic. Um, one, because uh, the argument doesn't seem very to hold much water right, if you're really under duress. Uh, and uh, uh, two, that uh, it, wastes, it wastes your hard disk. Right? It's, I mean, disk is, is cheap, but it's not free. Okay? Uh, it also increases the risk of overwrite. Okay? So if every block that I'm writing, I have to write a second block or maybe more, but essentially halved or less right, the capacity of my hard disk drive. Okay. So these are, all, these are kind of the problems that we're going to try to avoid in our new, um, uh, in our new uh, uh, file system here called Defy. OK, I've already mentioned a little bit about how hard disk drives work. Um, if you ever opened one up, they're, they're pretty uh, neat looking. OK, so uh, just, a, just a quick, quick overview. Is this OK, Ryan, if I write here? Yeah. OK. No more. <laughs> all right. There's the, there's the Rubicon. Um, OK, so if you ever open one of these guys up, Right, there's some rotating media, there's typically some uh, logic. This thing spins around you know, 5,000, 7,000, 10,000 RPMs. Uh, there's an arm okay, that moves back and forth, and basically where that arm is, it draws a concentric circle. Okay? We call that thing a track. That's where you're actually your data lives. Okay? That track is broken up into small things called sectors. That's the, that's the minimum I.O. you can do to a, tis, a disk drive. It's about 512 bytes. More often than not, though, your file system uh, your operating system is writing much larger data, 4K, 8K. Some file systems, like big file systems, write maybe a megabyte. Of, like that's the minimum I/O, and we do that for throughput reasons um, and to align with our memory system, okay, like our caching system. That's our discussion for operating systems. Okay. The in important thing to know is though that the physical layout, the physical addresses of these blocks, is pretty well represented by the logical abstraction, meaning that your operating system provides your file system a logical view of this disk, and pretty much one for one, block zero maps to block zero. Okay, or block one maps to block one. Occasionally, and it's, it's maybe, mo uh, maybe more so now than used to, hard, hard disk drives are getting smarter. Okay? In fact, there's a large amount of your hard disk drive that's not accessible to you, such for, uh, for, uh, for reasons of reliability. Okay, so if a sector starts to go bad, the hard disk drive detects that and maps it somewhere else. Okay, so occasionally this happens. In fact, whole tracks can get, can get remapped. In fact, um, hard disk drives lie about a lot of stuff uh, nowadays. But they're remarkable devices. Um, they were, the, the, the cost per bit is incredible, right? I mean, what does it cost for a terabyte drive now? Like, what, 60 bucks? I mean, that's, that's amazing. It's amazing, um, and you know it, that's only going to get cheaper. You know, it's 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 cheap, but it's slow. Okay, that's that's the trade-off we pay. So uh, we got tired of slowness. In fact, it, it's kind of hilarious to think that there's still uh, a component in our heart, in our computers that has moving parts, right? It's like some sort of like Jules Verne device, right? Uh, powered by steam. Um, okay, so we have found that. What we like actually is, is uh, faster response times, more uniform response times, okay? So uh, this arm has to move, which means that if you're far away from the arm, it costs time in, on the order of like, let's say 10 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds is forever, right? It is a upwards of a million times slower, right, of uh, going to L1 cache, like on your CPU. But again, cheap. Uh, 
the new marketplace has basically come up with types of flash memory, um, and there's different kinds. The most prevalent is called NAND flash, okay? Um, and it is essentially just a big array of you know, uh, non-volatile RAM, essentially, okay? Uh, and it's got some special characteristics, though. I already mentioned one, okay? Is that there's this duty cycle on these things, and you can't write to the same address more than once. Uh, uh, well, you can only write to it a limited number of times before it just stops accepting writes, okay? The other thing is that unlike a hard disk drive where you can do I.O. essentially on the sector, you can both do read and write and erasures, I mean, that, that's essentially just a, another write, um, on the same amount, on the same integral amount of data, 512 bytes, that's not true for flash storage, at least for, for most NAND flash storage. All right, there's a thing called, a, I want to make sure I get my terminology right here. Uh, pages, yes, okay, so you write to pages, okay, which are typically on the order of 4K, whoops, not 44, 4K, and you erase, you, you know, read, read and write, sorry, read, read and write, <coughs> and then you erase on, called blocks, and those are closer to like 256K. You can only write to a page that has been erased, okay? Just the, the, the way that NAND works is essentially it expects an all zero block and then you write ones to it, okay? You can't write, overwrite data in place. You have to erase the block first, okay? So this is a little challenging, meaning that um, the things that we do to, let's say, delete data on a hard disk drive, which is essentially to write zeros over it or maybe write patterns of ones and zeros over it to essentially degauss the media, no longer flies on these things which I'm really um, suspicious of modern, like, um, um, you know, OS X, which has that secure erase. Uh, as far as I'm aware, that just does random data to the logical address space, okay? Uh, what I think is happening is that it's just writing random data, right, down your disk, okay? Maybe not over the data itself. Okay, and this is because, I forgot to tell you, the other thing it does, um, in order to uh, prevent that duty cycle, from wearing out too quickly is do something called wear leveling. So on the, um, the device itself, it does something called wear leveling, meaning that if this is uh, logical block zero, and this is physical block zero, maybe the first time you do a write to logical block zero, it goes to physical block zero. The next time, it's gonna go to physical block one. <coughs> the next time, it's gonna go to physical block two, okay? So it's creating essentially implicit versions of your data over time. And so if you say, hey, overwrite that data, what you're probably doing is just writing so your data still lives here, and then you just go on to write random data beyond it. Now, this is something that's implemented by the hardware. And so again, I'll, I'll go back. I think it's a sophisticated app. So you, if you ask, hey, give me logical block zero, it's going to give you whatever it thought the last thing it wrote was, right? And so if it's random data, it'll return you random data. That doesn't mean that those bits of your data don't still exist somewhere on those chips. And so if I could get those chips off and do some advanced uh, forensic techniques, like putting an electron microscope on it, I might be able to get that data back again. Your question? Yeah. Um, so if Write isn't, uh, writing isn't limited to blocks. You can go down to the size of pages. How is erasure limited to just something as big as a block? Okay, so you can read and write on pages, okay? And once you fill a block, right, uh, you would go on to the next block, okay? Let's, let's make that sure that's clear. If I want to free up that data, let's say only some of the blocks, are, uh, some of the pages are used within that block, what a, uh, a smart uh, a flash translation layer will do is move those blocks forward and then erase that entire page. Move the pages forward? Move the pages forward and then erase the entire block, right? So you have contiguous memory uh, that's available for rewriting, okay? Why does it work like that? Uh, just due to the, um, the, to keep costs down, the circuitry uh, it was built that way. Okay. Um, there, there are, uh, you can pay more money and get granularity. All right, we've got a hand in the back. 
It's because to write to NAND, it doesn't take that much electricity, but if you want to erase it, you have to really zap the shit out of it, and you can't uh, zap it with that kind of granularity without possibly interfering with things next to it. Okay. So you can't get the same like physical density out of the chips if you aren't going to be able to erase on a more granular level. That's right. When you say erase over write, you mean like volume of time over full write? I mean like... You can talk about blocks are erased. You have to erase an entire block at a time. You can write a single page at a time. Yeah. And so, in, in order to erase that block, you need a much more powerful okay. Yeah, search. Okay. okay. So good. I, I, I believe I believe that to be true. I also believe that the the, the circuitry uh, is is. Um, becomes more expensive too if you try to do finer grain uh, erasures. Maybe maybe we're saying the kind of the same thing different ways. Yeah. So why would they write random data when they can simply just erase every single block if you're looking to securely wipe the drive? If they could erase every single block. Because that should get everything off the drive, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You just, I mean, you could put a bullet through the thing too, right? <laughs> uh, there's, what, what we're typically when we talk about erasure, we, what we want is secure uh, deletion on a finer granularity than the entire device, right? So I want to delete a file. All right. I want to drag some files to the trash, and I want to be able to secure delete those. Not. Yeah. So you're absolutely right, though, that if I wanted to securely erase the drive, I could just write random data until I knew it looped the log, and, and that might that might be good. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, there are lots of stories of people, uh, I mean, go on to eBay and buy some old hard disk drives and see what a good job they've done uh, wiping those. That was a, a fun pastime that some of my friends used to do. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes, but I, I think there's still an argument um, that fine grain erasures, there's actually some laws in place. So, for example, if you're a doctor's office uh, and your patient says, please remove my um, uh, HIPAA protected medical records from your system, the doctor is not um, incented to throw away his entire computer or his, or his entire storage array, right? He wants finer grain deletion than that. Okay, these are good questions. Okay. So that was actually, there's actually a recent data breach regarding secure deletion of HIPAA records that a piece of malware got on one of those computers and was able to get all the information that had previously been on the computer as well. So. Yep. Okay, so uh, that kind of sets the stage um, for what I wanted to talk about. So all previous deniable file systems were predicated on my ability to write, overwrite in place, or at least write with targeted granularity, meaning that I, if I wanted to write to logical block zero, it mapped to physical block zero, and if I overwrote logical block zero, it overwrote physical block zero. Okay. That if I didn't do that, then I'm essentially creating some history of the data that I'm writing. Okay? And I, do, I don't want to do that. Okay? All encrypted file systems, too. Also, the, the semantic security, um, and we'll talk about this uh, in another 20 minutes or so uh, over there, uh, also says that you should, when you do deterministic encryption, the type of encryption that hard disk drives require, um, you want to be able to overwrite in place. Okay? That's just not something that's capable. So we need to somehow change the paradigm in which we're encrypting data and expect it to uh, um, expect the file system, expect the uh, flash device to essentially write in a log. Okay. Now writing in a log is not a new idea. Um, back in the 80s, the early 80s, there was a movement to do log structured file systems. So as opposed to ext3 or, or FAT or NTFS or kind of whatever the modern file systems that we're using now. They essentially have a structure for where blocks live on disk. And so if you write uh, to a particular area um, you know, in some directory, those blocks are allocated from a particular space on disk. Okay? The log structure file system basically says, just write wherever the disk head is now. Just keep moving forward. Okay? Uh, and it has a lot of neat properties. Consistency is one. So basically you can write the data and then write a checkpoint and say like, my file system's consistent up to this point. And if you write data and you crash before the checkpoint, you have an immediate place where you can roll back to. Okay? Uh, also, uh, implicit versioning. So versioning's nice, so I can actually, as I write data, I never overwrite in place, I just keep writing forward. 
And so I can always look back at old versions of, of my data. The problem is they, didn't, they were great for writes, okay? high write performance, terrible read performance, because our blocks would get uh, fragmented all over the disk. And so uh, very, very slow read performance for hard disk drives. Log structures may be making a comeback because um, in addition to already kind of writing a log, that these things have order one access, uh, random access time. Okay, it doesn't matter where I am. There is, there is no disk head to move, right? So all of these essentially have uniform access time. And so that problem with sequential reads goes away. So our um, system is essentially create an encrypted file system for log structured file systems. What would that look like? Okay, so there's essentially two core ideas, okay? The first is a, um, I already mentioned, a log structured, uh, structured uh, file system. That supports multiple deny ability levels. Okay. So a deniability level is basically I can write data at different levels of secrecy. Okay. And I can reveal a key to one level, and you can't prove that there are other levels above it. Right? Maybe you keep uh, hitting me with the rubber hose, and I will reveal, reveal another level. And maybe that will satisfy you. And you should have no more information about how many more levels there are. Okay? So some deniable file systems kind of stupidly uh, have a fixed number. Right? So that's essentially playing sec the security through obscurity game and hope that your adversary can't just like look at the source code and say, oh, okay, well, 10. I'm going to keep beating you to give me 10. Okay? <laughs> this has an arbitrary number of deniability levels. Right? So you can create as many as you want. Um, okay, that's one. Uh, and then two, the other uh, core idea is that as it writes forward, it implicitly deletes old data as part of the log, okay? So sometimes we want to keep that old data around, that gives us versioning, sometimes we don't, and not in this setting. So if I write a new block, I want that old block to be removed, okay? And actually we leverage that idea of having some old blocks in the past to give us even more plausible deni deniability against a snapshotting adversary, right? It gives us some explanation for why there's random looking data all over our disk in kind of scattered places. Because you say, like, that's an old version of data. I don't know how to decrypt it anymore. It's deleted by policy. OK. And the last thing, there's one, uh, uh, the, the second core idea is an algorithm, a new cryptographic algorithm. I'll go, uh, algorithm. Sorry. This is why I'm into computer science, right? Algorithm. OK. Let me describe it real fast in a, at a real high level. Okay, um, what we do is we, we have some data. Okay, so big D gets broken into little blocks of data. Let's call it uh, DN. They're N blocks, okay? We stick that into uh, AES. And this is partially a lie because uh, there's, there's, there's some special things. There's a called a mode of operation we've got to put AES into. Not important for this discussion, but just so AES, the advanced encryption standard, is kind of like the de facto um, block cipher. So you, it takes a 128-bit key, and it takes in a 128-bit block size, and it produces 128-bit ciphertext. If you want to encrypt bigger things, you've got to put it into a mode of operation. Let's just presume that this thing's in a, in a secure mode of operation. Okay? So I take my data and I stick it in to this thing, and I get uh, ciphertext out. I also want to authenticate my data. So AES provides confidentiality, meaning that if I give you the block, you shouldn't be able to learn any information. If I give you the ciphertext block, you shouldn't be able to learn any information about the plain text, none, okay? Uh, not given millions of years, okay? Maybe, maybe trillions and trillions of years, but not millions, okay? Uh, we'll all be long be dead before you encrypt, uh, decrypt anything encrypted with AES, okay? But that does not say I can't tamper with that data, and when you decrypt it, it'll decrypt to something different, okay? That's a different problem. That's an, a problem of integrity, or what we sometimes call authenticity. So we need a new construct for that, uh, and we call that uh, a, a MAC, 
an HMAC is one is a MAC based on uh, hash functions. Okay, so uh, we've got an HMAC here, so we're going to MAC the data as well. And this is actually uh, uh, really important to our scheme. Uh, and so what this creates is something called a tag. Uh, let me let me write that as T. Uh, is that right? Yeah. And let me write it as sigma. Okay, sigma is just the um, cryptographer's notation for for a tag. Okay, it's actually a small amount of data, right? I I can um, make I can detect whether you've tampered with any bit in here uh, with just 128 bits of, of attack, okay? Um, in fact, it should be hard for you to come up to forge a new tag without knowing the key. Oh, this is also a keyed function. Okay, so we encrypt the data, we MAC the data, and then we do something kind of wacky. We encrypt the data again using the, t the tag, the sigma, as the key. Okay. And what this gives us is some more kind of double encrypted ciphertexts. And we do one last step. Okay. We XOR that sigma with all the X's. I'll explain why we're doing this nonsense. Why not? why not? Yeah, why not? Okay. <laughs> Just keep going. Okay. So what we're left with is actually what we store on disk are the X's. Okay. And the tag. T. <coughs> that thing. What I just did, okay, these steps right here represents something called all or nothing encryption. Okay, sometimes called the AON transform. All or nothing encryption means that if any one of these blocks is missing or has been deleted, I can't decrypt the data anymore. So let me kind of prove to you by example about why, why that would work. Okay, well let's run this backwards to decrypt it. Okay, so what do I need to decrypt it? Well, I need all these blocks and T. If I XOR those things together, what do I get out again? Sigma. Once I have sigma, then I can do this decryption, right? And then I can verify that this, is, this was untampered with, and I can decrypt this with the, I, with the key that I started with, my user key, let's say, or my level key. What happens if I remove one of these blocks? Yeah, sigma changes, okay? It'll decrypt to something, but the Mac won't verify, and I stop, okay? If I remove, let's say, a block's worth of data, a, a cryptographic block, 128 bits, an adversary essentially has to now guess a number between zero and two to the 128th minus one, right, and do this operation. That's an infeasible, what we call a negligible, non-negligible amount of time, right? That will take more time than the universe has been in existence to date, right? So even if you started when the Big Bang, you still wouldn't be done yet, okay? All right, so that's the core idea, okay? That's the core algorithm that we use. All data that gets encrypted to the device goes through this process. And we do have this little bit of extra data. This is the trickiness, okay? That, so I started out with, let's say, 4K of data, and I get 4K of ciphertext plus some extra data. So I need to store that someplace. So I store it in a, a just part of the metadata, okay? So, you know, metadata is like, you know, the <coughs> inode, the thing that describes where blocks live on disk. I'm just gonna store it in there. So let me give you a view of what the, so this, is, this is flash storage here. And we have some file object. And there are data blocks. Okay, so let's call those D0, D1. And then we have our tags. We've got T0 and T1, okay? And those live in a single block there, okay? We'll call that the metadata. Now remember, we're dealing with a log structured file system. So there's always some head of the log, meaning where am I gonna write to next? That's stored someplace. So let's say the head was there. Here's the nifty little bit, and this is gonna achieve the implicitly deletes old data. 
When I go to modify, let's say I want to modify D0. I want to modify one block. I'm going to create a new file object who has some new change data. So I've got my old device here. So D1 still exists as part of the old, uh, this, uh, the same version. So we don't know what's there. I forgot to put a question mark there. That's, that's some data that that's, we don't know what's there. Um, here's where D0 used to live. Here's where the metadata used to live. I'm going to write a new version of D0 and a new metadata block. And in that new metadata block, I'm going to write the new version of, of T0 prime, the new tag that I generated for the, my new D0. But I keep the old T1. Okay, so that gets written there, and the data basically says, here's D0, and here's D1. When I wrote a new T1, oh, sorry, a new uh, T0, I essentially have now forgotten the old T0. And what that means is that if I don't have T0 anymore, can't decrypt that block anymore. Now, you might be saying, well, wait a minute. Doesn't that T0 live there? OK. And the answer is yes, except that this file also has a tag. And its tag lives in the parent directory's metadata. And then that parent directory's tags live in its parent's directory, all the way up to the root. And so that every time we do an IO operation to one, we essentially rotate the tags all the way up the chain. And so, in fact, this metadata, that tag for that old metadata, for that metadata right there, is now gone, right? It's gone because its parent also rotated its tag, OK? And we do this all the way to the root of the tree. And the root <coughs> directory basically has these special tags that we know we can overwrite in place. They, they get put into a special place in flash storage. Some flash storage allocates a small amount of memory that allows you, that guarantees that if you overwrite it in place, it will be overwritten. Okay? This is kind of the state of the art, and it is to support schemes just like this. Okay? This is the state of art for doing secure deletion uh, for flash-based storage. Okay? So essentially, every time that I write, I'm rotating the tag and forgetting the old version. So when an adversary looks at this, he's going to see this version, D0 prime and D1, and this is going to look random, that's going to look random, that's going to look random, and uh, that's the head of the log. Okay? And he's going to say, well, can you decrypt that block? Or how did that block come to exist? And he's like, well, I wrote some data. Can you decrypt the old version? No, I can't. By policy, it's gone. Right? That tag doesn't exist anymore. You're welcome to try. <laughs> right? Okay. Yes? Wouldn't that, uh, the tag of the root of the file system become like a dead sector and a dead bit of flash memory really, really quickly? It is a, I don't know how they're doing this. Um, I, it may be that they're actually not doing it in NAND storage. They may be doing it in another type of storage. Uh, is there any flaw with um, going uh, sequentially writing the blocks, but for each, uh, once a block is done, writing all to it. Or that is further out the, uh... Well, I think that it's actually when you erase a block, that's what that's what essentially happens, I right? It. it gets written all all it gets set to all zeros. Or maybe yeah, all yeah. Ones. Well, but but isn't it, it gets set to all zeros, and then when you write here, it's you're just writing once to it. Right. Well, why is it if they don't just write? It? In all the spaces where there are, are zeros within a block that needs to be deleted or uh, erased, just write once to it. Oh, 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 fill it in? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that was the right there. Oh, I see. Why do you have to write things to it? Well, when you write oh, just, oh, just write one? Like that's a good question. Why is it write so different than erasure? Uh, Oh, actually, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, no, he brings up the point. Isn't it easier to write a one than the whole point about erasure that you're saying I have to zap the shit out of it is that uh, writing zeros is hard, basically. So if you write all ones to it, then at some point you have to write a zero to write data. 
Right, yeah, you don't want to use it again. And you can't but, do granular well, zeros. But for deletion. You, can, you can't write zeros easily, right? Yeah, you so, can't do it. Yeah. You could fill it with ones, though, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, you, in order to write data to it, you have to zap it and then write it. Oh, uh, right, so right. At some point, you have to zap it. Yeah, yeah at some point, you, yeah. You have to zap it, and if you write all those ones <laughs> the first time, you've wasted a write on every single cell that you have to now. Yeah, that may be true. That's a good question. I'll look into that. OK. So. We built this thing. Uh, we, we built it. We built it on top of YAFS. Uh, YAFS is an existing, uh, existing log structured file system designed for flash storage on mobile devices. And so it, it basically implemented the log structuring for us. We just added some of these additional, we, we uh, retrofitted the metadata. Um, there's, there's nothing specific about YAFS. Um, it, this was just kind of a proof of concept for these ideas. Uh, and it turns out that like, mobile phones are totally capable of like, doing this kind of encryption. Like this is, AES is really fast. In fact, some, um, uh, some even uh, mobile processors have uh, AES accelerated um, instructions. Uh, on the chips themselves. So we were able to achieve really good performance. Uh, and the, the security argument that we make is one that given a snapshot, a, a, sorry, a single view, right, you can't figure out what this data is because AES is still a hard problem, okay? The more interesting argument is given snapshots over time, is there a plausible explanation for what your file system looks like. And so the argument that we made was essentially for every core I.O. operation, there's at least two things that could have happened, okay? And um, from a, I, I gotta wrap this up because I gotta run over to class, but I just wanna make one last point <laughs> where I'm gonna give like the, <laughs> the, the secondary, I was gonna give this talk over there too, so. Uh, okay, so let me do a quick, uh, a quick example. <laughs> All right, so remember, we're going to write data at, at different levels, too. And so I might reveal one level, and if you cannot decrypt the data uh, for other, you need to have some explanation for why there are, like, undecryptable blocks in between valid data blocks. So let me give you a, just a quick um, type of argument that we made. Uh, okay, so, so let's say this was data, and this was metadata. Okay, and this is the head of the log. So all forward blocks are, are um, undecrypted, uh, are, uh, look random, okay? So I can do a couple different things. I can do a write at level zero, okay? So let's say this is level zero data. So I can essentially do, I'm going to erase the old metadata block. I'm going to write a new metadata block uh, and a new data block. And everything else after that is we still don't know. And then I can do a delete at level zero. Yes? What does level zero represent? Uh, the, we could, let's say we had a total ordering to our deniability level. So uh, we had uh, L0 is less than L1 is less than L2. Sorry. <laughs> L. L. Um, yeah. So if I, if I have multiple deniability levels, I essentially I create an encryption key for every one of my levels. I'm getting uh, hit with a wet noodle. I mean, here's, the level, here's level zero key, right? Uh, and uh, that will decrypt all data that's been encrypted with the level zero key, but nothing else. So let me do a delete at level zero, and here's what it finally looks like. Uh, we have this data block, and then everything else in between, we write a new metadata block, okay, has been <coughs> erased. Or it's like, we have no way, we're gonna write a new metadata block that essentially overwrites the tags, except for this data block. This is the same, this looks exactly the same, in the case that we wrote at level one. So this is gonna, I need to use two different pens here. <coughs> oh yeah, it's one 
Okay, so I'm going to use level two, oh, sorry, level one in this, this lighter color. Okay, so um, by policy, every time that we write data at a higher level, we write the metadata for the lower levels after it. Okay, so here I wrote this data, I wrote this file at level one, and then I wrote the level zero metadata to rewrite it after it, okay? This is for a couple reasons, because when I hide level one, I don't want to, if, if my metadata was still back here, the, f the first place I would go to overwrite the log is over the data, the higher level data, okay? So we talked about building some strategies for not doing overwriting. This is one of them, okay? So you always write your data in kind of uh, decreasing order. What does this look like, though, if I, um, unmount level one and just have level zero. Well, essentially, it'll look exactly like that, right? These two blocks in the middle go to question marks. Uh, I may have drawn one too many question marks here, sorry. Yeah. So these two things should be essentially indistinguishable, right? If I reveal uh, how do I say? Oh, I say hide. Right, so hide level one. That, that's, that looks in the same, right, as if I had done these operations at level zero or if I had done these operations at level one. Yeah, question on you. So if you decrypt, if you, if you decrypt level zero and then you can see the metadata and the data, couldn't the uh, attacking party just say, well, there is, why don't, why don't I look between the data and the metadata, there's, some, there's something here. Okay, so you're saying like if there was a, an undecrypted block like, like here? No, so you have, so the bottom structure, you have D, question mark, question mark, question mark, M. Can't the person say, well, there's probably something between that D and M? Yeah, there was old versions of data uh, that I wrote. All right. Yeah. Yeah. But then how does that get around a potential adversary viewing the metadata and saying, oh, well, this tag, you know, maybe this tag, uh, this number of tags associated with this, this number of blocks over here, but there are tags that don't, don't really correlate. So every block of data, variables? every block of data that's live in the file system has exactly one tag. Yeah, and when you overwrite uh, oh, that data, the you overwrite. Thing every time. Yeah, yeah. So there are a few um, uh, 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 limitations to this. One is that we have to generate these level keys some way in a usable way, um, and that's generally doing passwords, right? So you have password-based key derivation for these things. So this thing's only as secure as the passwords that you choose for each for each level. Um, there's also we, we're not secure against things like malware on the phone. Right? So if you have a, a, some, some malware that's running on your phone that sees your data at a high level, it can just send it over the network. Right? So there's nothing we can really do about that uh, crypto-wise. And there's also the kind of more interesting attack called the colluding character, uh, carrier. So if you are mounted at a high level and you're doing operations like surfing the web or um, uploading photos or, or something, that colluding character may give, sorry, colluding carrier may give your adversary saying like, you know, we saw him do this traffic. See if you can identify like the, some forensic evidence that he did those things on the disk. And it said like, oh, you did some web browsing, but in your history, your web browsing history hasn't changed at all. You must have been doing that at a higher level, okay? So uh, hopefully, um, <laughs> yeah, this is, it's, it's kind of a, yeah, that's a very powerful adversary, right? One who's essentially willing to give up all your metadata to the, to the government, yeah. Um, if you're making a list, wouldn't all the direct memory access vulnerabilities also kind of this? Say again, direct memory, yeah, so, right. Um, cold boot attacks, uh, so if I kind of freeze the memory, yeah, that's another thing that uh, essentially one of the things we built in was kind of an emergency close all levels and, and wipe the memory. Yeah, because yeah, cryptographic keys have to live someplace. All right, thank you for your time. I gotta run uh, and give this again. Um, uh, if, if you want to know more about this